Hi, this is Eric Prostowski, and welcome to another episode of EP on EP. We're delighted to have uh, Pasquale Santanginelli back again for part two of this wonderful discussion on VT ablation in patients with normal hearts. Welcome, Pasquale. Thank you for having me, Eric. The papillary muscle. Can you just give us like your, your approach? I mean, they can be real tricky. I mean, I know stability is an issue, and I know that it's not uncommon, especially in prolapse, to have multiple areas. Um, how do you approach the PAPs? So I, I had to say, those are probably the most challenging uh, type of PVCs or, or VT that we have to really target. And the reason for that is because we are limited in terms of the anatomical reconstruction. Even if you use intracardiac echo, it's always a 2D modality. And uh, we very rarely can appreciate all the crevices, all the pouches around the pub muscles, and also the, uh, sometimes they have multiple heads. It becomes really complicated. The second aspect, so, you, yeah, so the first issue, of course, mapping the entire, I would say, width and length of the structure and the complexity of the structure. The second issue is uh, ablation, of course, because right now, and probably electroporation will overcome that issue because you don't need to be in contact. But right now, ablation is a contact sport, so we have to be in contact with the tissue that we want to ablate. And uh, with a beating heart uh, and uh, the patient breathing as well, which is typically what we do with conscious sedation for idiopathic PVC, it's extremely challenging to keep your catheter position in the intracavitary structure for long enough uh, to create uh, an adequate lesion. And the second issue is that they're extremely arrhythmogenic. And where sometimes you come on a radio frequency, patients go in polymorphic VT or sometimes even VF. We've seen that we, and that, of course, you can't really keep ablating in those conditions. So there are some tricks that you can, uh, use, for example, cryoablation uh, with a cryocatheter. Uh, usually we use a six millimeters, but there is experience also with eight millimeter. Does help fairly well in those, uh, in those situations, just because first of all, it's not arrhythmogenic. So cryo is different from radio frequencies. You won't see any uh, proarrhythmia from it. And second of all, it will stick to the papillary muscle throughout the lesion. And it's been very effective when radio frequency ablation has failed. It's and, uh, not, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. I was going to say, it sounds like, though, you'll try RF first, and yeah. that, that's kind of your bailout ablation uh, cryo. It's not like you would use that initially. Yes, right? exactly. We use, actually, uh, radio frequency always, and cryo is only in a minority of patients. We reported a small series uh, um, uh, in your journal, when it used to be the journal, when you were right. the editor. You were the editor. You were the editor at the time. So yeah. 15 uh, with, years uh, was, was just enough. <laughs> yes, yeah. yeah, yeah. But, but yeah, so, um, and uh, we show that increases success in, in cases that were refractory with uh, radio frequency ablation. And, and again, uh, that was only as used as a bill out and, they, and we don't use it as a first line approach on, in these cases. So uh, the papillary muscles can be thick and sometimes you're not exactly sure right where things are coming from. And I know that you can hit a site you think is good and then they exit somewhere else. So do you also use the strategy of lower power long time or what's, what is your ablation strategy? For the papillary muscles, yeah. yeah. But energy so uh, uh, yes, historically we've been using the same and the papillary muscle. I have to say, I personally have transitioned to higher power, uh, and just because typically the contact force that you can achieve and the contour and systole and diastole uh, is not adequate. So I, uh, it's very rare to have a steam pop on the papillary muscle, just because, especially when you're bleeding the body of the papillary muscle or the tip of the papillary muscle, because you're not in contact throughout the cardiac cycle. So usually I use higher power because you can afford to uh, have higher power. One of the issues that we didn't talk about the LV summit, we, and also even more important for the pump muscle, is whether we're hurting people with uh, ablating these structures. Uh, when you ask about the power delivery, uh, there are some case reports of uh, pseudoaneurysm in the LV summit for patients that were treated with very high power for long duration. So always be careful that trade the power according to an impedance drop. In the papillary muscle region, one of the concerns is the um, uh, uh, mechanical injury to the papillary muscle and, and therefore uh, mitral regurgitation. Mm -hmm. That hasn't been shown, uh, at least in our center. Uh, we uh, always use intracardiac echo to decide where to ablate. We monitor our lesions and uh, we have actually an abstract, uh, not mine, it was the Dr. Dixit actually put it together uh, for HRS that shows no impact of uh, uh, ablation of the papillary muscle on the mitral valve function over time. That's great to know. Um, of course, that'll never stand the test of time. You know, someone is absolutely going to get into trouble someday. And they're going to say, but I read this paper from Pasquale and he said, you don't get the trouble. And um, he'll pay his check and uh, he'll move on. Uh, but let me end with this. Um, 
you you get all, everything set. You've got you got your twelve lead. Um, you figured out where where you're going to head. You get in the lab and you have no PVC and you do the usual running in from ISO to EPI to whatever the you know the medicine du jour is to try to make PVCs happen. Just briefly tell us what do you do? What's your approach at that point? Yeah, so um, my personal approach uh, is uh, to bring the patient back. And uh, unfortunately, because I am an, not a strong believer of, um, uh, of pace mapping, and uh, the reason why I don't believe that in particular in the alpha tract, because there is a lot of data that shows preferential conduction in that area. So you can have early activation in the coronary cusp, you can have best pace map a centimeter away in the RVOT, et cetera. Uh, the criticism that my colleagues uh, usually um, you know, uh, have uh, with my approach is that I don't look at the pace map carefully, uh, looking at all the notches, et cetera. So if you do it right, if you spend a lot of time, you may have some success. The reality is, uh, I think we need to have more studies because there are some data from the 80s that PVCs come and go. And uh, if a patient uh, comes to the EP lab with no anesthesia and there's no PVCs, probably uh, in, the, in that phase where the PVCs are going away, if you repeat a halter a month later and they're gone, is that because you did an ablation gathered by pace map or it just simply regression to the mean? And that was just a good month for the patient. So I think we need to uh, be very careful when we interpret this data, even our own successes guided by uh, a strategy that doesn't show acute success. In other words, if you have PVCs in front of you, you could turn on a ref and they go away, they vanish, you know that you did something. If the patient in the lab has nothing and you start pace mapping here and then, you deliver a couple of lesions, do a, a halter a month later, and there is no PVCs, is that a success or not? I don't know. I mean, statistically, maybe, but I mean, there is a lot of uh, chance that comes into play, in my opinion. So I think you bring up an important point. I'll just make, make two quick comments and then we'll, we'll, you and I will finish up this, uh, this great interview. You've, you've been terrific, uh, great information, Pasquale. Um, number one, I've been routinely doing now a seven day hold through. They're simple, you put a patch on. Because before I send my, my patients to, to my ablators in the lab, I want to get a sense that really every day they're having something because if I get a patient that you know has you know fifteen thousand PBCs one day and then two thousand for three or four days in a row, I know that could be a struggle in the lab and you know it's the kind of thing maybe that's not the best patient at that point. The second thing is you're absolutely right with the PBCs going away. Many years ago, decades ago, there was a study published. I don't remember if it was mixolipine, but it was one of the drugs where they had a washout period and they stopped, they stopped the drug for like a few days and repeated Holter monitors. Uh, and all these patients, many of whom we thought the drug had suppressed all their PBCs, guess what, they were gone. <laughs> and you know, they were just gone. So uh, we all know in the outflow track area, I can't say that's true for other areas, uh, PBCs over time can go away. So your point is extremely well taken that, that we probably ought to have some better metrics for calling success. We shouldn't look at a holder a week later. Um, I think your point's well taken. That would make uh, a nice, uh, you know, multi-center study to like we're doing with AFID now, looking at the burden because uh, they can be even asset, right? And you you think you've got a success, or you think you made a success when they went away on their own. So yeah. I think you're raising. Just, if point. I can just add one one more thing. I mean, actually, sure. we uh, one one um, uh, circumstance where PISMAP works uh, is when we have a little bit of a patch of a substrate with uh, you can target the long stem TQRS and the PVCs are coming from around there, even in the outflow tract. And uh, in that, we did report a good outcomes. And uh, Rob Schaller was actually the senior author of that paper. I just want to add that just to give the full picture. But in general, I don't particularly like to use pace mapping. <laughs> well, that'll be a big controversy on when this is posted. Uh, I can see Twitter going now uh, because there are camps with that. And you're right. But um, your approach is um, obviously maybe a little safer, but I, I know I'll get beat up on that one. Uh, Pasquale, this has been a fabulous interview from soup to nuts on uh, what you call normal to how do you ablate certain uh, really gnarly areas uh, to how you define success. Thank you so much for educating all of us in this area. Thank you for having me, Eric. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.